Hey everyone, so thanks for very much for coming out. I'm Chris Palmer and this is Adam Rumjan, and we're from Innovo 3D. Uh, my background is in engineering chemistry and now I work in operations and on the startup side of things. And Adam is a mechanical engineer and he builds our printers. So at Innovo 3D, we're focused on industrial additive manufacturing using high performance polymers. So in short, we basically make printers that print with plastics that are as durable as metals. And one of these high performance polymers that we're particularly excited about is called PEAK. Um, so we're going to tell you a little bit more detail about PEAK today. Basically it's strong, it's chemically resistant, it's thermally resistant, and it's also biocompatible. Hence printing parts for people. You can actually print uh, implants and parts like that. Great. Um, so PEAK, or polyether ether ketone, as I mentioned, is a very high strength polymer. It's actually almost as strong as pure titanium. Um, it's also very durable, and its strength to weight ratio is higher than aluminum's, but it has half the density of aluminum. So it's an excellent replacement for metal parts where you want an economical, but also industrial and strong solution. Uh, it's also temperature and chemically resistant. It's ultra low wear and low friction, and it's biocompatible. So let's take a look at some of the applications where these specific material properties make it really, really helpful material in industry. Um, it's actually been available as an industrial material since the 80s, and it's currently being used in uh, bearings and bushings, where because it's really low wear and it's also low friction, it's an excellent material. Um, it's used in automotive applications, where because it's both strong, durable, and flame retardant and heat resistant, uh, it's excellent for parts like, um, like bearings and also seals. Um, it has also acoustic properties and a dielectric strength that makes it excellent for use in the electronics industry. Um, and it also has a broader range of applications in aerospace. For example, because it's both strong and chemically resistant, it's been used in fuel line assemblies. Um, because it's not corroded by the fuel like metal parts would be. Um, but it also has another interesting application in aerospace, which is reducing weight of aircraft. So if you swap out a bunch of metal parts for a bunch of peak parts, you can drive the, the weight of your plane down. And if you have a fleet of 500 aircraft and you can reduce 45 kilos from each aircraft, you're looking at about 5 million US dollars just in fuel savings annually. And of course, you're preventing yourself from burning fuel, so not only do you not have to pay for it, but you're also vastly reducing your emissions, which is a really important topic in the aerospace industry today. Um, one of the applications that we're the most excited about with Peak, though, is really in biomedical applications, because it's not only as strong, as I've mentioned, almost as strong as pure titanium, but it's also biocompatible. So it's being used as a lower cost alternative um, lower processing cost alternative to titanium in implants. Uh, titanium actually is widely used, but has a few issues in medical implants. One of them is that uh, it being a metal, it can cause these artifacts in imaging techniques like MRI or uh, CT scans. Uh, and this can be a really big problem because if you put an implant into a patient and then you can't really see perfectly the area around the implant, as a doctor you can misdiagnose things like infections and this can lead to significant problems for the patient. So peak being an inert plastic does not have these issues. Um, additionally with titanium, because it's a metal, your body is uh, sometimes prone to rejecting it and it can cause metal contamination of your bloodstream. Peak again being an inert polymer has neither of these issues, so it's very appealing. Uh, in implants. Okay, so peak is great. It's very helpful. How are people actually making peak parts today? Uh, well, injection molding and CNC are the traditional technologies that are used. Now, these are well understood and robust technologies, but they have some issues, especially at smaller scale, which are that they can be high setup time, high setup cost, and in the case of CNC, very high waste, which is especially a problem with an expensive material like peak. Um, so, we've also seen that there's, interest, there's broad interest in peak in uh, additive manufacturing. We're seeing some other startups here that are also working on um, producing parts with peak, which we think is really exciting because other people are also looking at this problem and thinking that it's something that needs to be solved. We're also hearing a lot of excitement from material suppliers who are already starting to produce the filament and hope that 3D printing in peak um, will be there in the near future. So far recently, in the last few years, we've seen people start to use peak in selective laser sintering or SLS technology. Um, 
this is really exciting because they're producing not only the parts that I mentioned previously, like aerospace, automotive parts, uh, bushings, gears, stuff like that, but they're also able to produce patient-specific implants. So whereas typically an implant, implants would be mass produced in sizes like small, medium, and large, and you just have to sort of find the nearest one that's the fit to your patient, with additive manufacturing, you can actually build a part that is specifically tailored to the geometry and the needs of each patient, which is a whole new world of possibility in medical industry. Um, so SLS can accomplish this. The issue with SLS right now is that it's extremely expensive. So how SLS works is you have to fill an entire build chamber with material. Um, in peak, in, uh, in many applications, this corresponds to about 100 kilograms of uh, peak powder. Now, throughout the process, you actually have to heat the entire chamber up to near the melting point of peak, which degrades this powder. Peak is pretty expensive. It can be upwards of $500 a kilo. So if we say conservatively it's $500 a kilo, you're looking at 100 kilos, this is 50,000 US dollars worth of material that's sitting in that chamber. Now, um, you typically would use about 20% of that material in the part, which leads to 80% waste, which means that you're losing 40,000 US dollars in material for one build, which is obviously a huge problem. Um, so this is why we're extremely excited about using fused filament fabrication uh, as an additive manufacturing technique with PEAK. It solves this problem of material waste because you only, use, you only heat the material that you use, which is coming in in the filament and ends up in the part, so it's very low material waste. Uh, additionally, with SLS techniques, you need several machines to pre- and post-process the materials and the parts, whereas with FDM printing, or FFF printing, sorry, you only need one printer, uh, and that machine that you need is typically cheaper than any of the three or four or five machines that you might need in an SLA printing workflow. So there is one issue in printing with Peak, using an FFF printer, which is that it's extremely difficult to do the properties of the material. Um, you might remember I said it was heat resistant. Well, <laughs> that makes it tough to print with using an FFF printer. So Adam's going to tell you a bit more about the material, the issues, and where our printer stands today. Thanks, Chris. So at Innovo, we've been dedicating the last 12 months to doing research and development to develop a new 3D printer that's capable of 3D printing with Peak and other high-performance polymers. We built a prototype and we began testing with high-quality Peak from some of the largest Peak manufacturers in the world. And that led us to some interesting opportunities last year. Uh, we were invited to come out to Berlin and we brought our 3D printer and participated in a couple of 3D printing events. One of them was the 3D Printing Summit in Berlin, and the other one was the Advanced Materials Competition. Uh, we received a lot of really amazing feedback and uh, positive support, and we decided that we would relocate to Berlin to be closer to our target market and continue our research. So as part of our ongoing research, we'd, we've identified two major challenges in being able to 3D print with Peak. One of them is the issue with strength, in that we're not seeing, we're not seeing similar strength to, say, injection molding. Um, and the other issue has to do with quality. So FTM printing or FFF printing has been available since the 80s. And since then, we've seen a lot of different 3D printing technologies come out and a lot of advancements in 3D printing. However, we haven't seen as much advancement in FDM or FFF 3D printing. Um, FFF 3D printing is still plagued by these two problems. And until we solve these problems, uh, FFF 3D printing is not going to be quite as feasible or viable as an industrial additive manufacturing solution because it just simply doesn't make sense to use a material like Peak or Ultim if it costs $500 or $800 a kilo, put it through a printer, and see that we don't get consistent results with strength uh, or isotropic strength as we would expect with, say, injection molding. So let's dive a little bit deeper into these two problems. So when it comes to strength, one of the major issues is uh, interlayer bonding. This is what causes the anisotropic properties of uh, FFF 3D printing. If we're 3D printing layer by layer and we apply forces in all three directions, we'll notice that we get different results in the Z direction. 
it's usually typically much weaker in the Z direction because these layers aren't fused well together. So when it comes to material like Peak, for example, which has a yield stress of about 100 MPa, with injection molding, we would expect 100 MPa's in all directions. With FFF 3D printing, we're seeing about 80 to 100 MPa in the X and Y direction, but we're seeing as low as 10 MPa, uh, which is 10% of the, of the original strength of this material in the Z direction. And this is a huge problem because, as I said before, it just simply doesn't make sense to use such an advanced, high strength material in this process if we're only seeing 10% of the strength in one direction. The other issue when it comes to peak is crystallinity. So peak is actually a semi-crystalline material, which means that it, it exists in amorphous and crystalline uh, uh, forms. Uh, usually a combination of the both, but it's more desirable to see it in a more crystalline form because that's where we see higher strength. So when we melt peak, all of these molecular structures start to break down, and then as it cools down again, it reforms. And in order to achieve a crystalline structure, we need to cool it down very slowly in order for these crystals well, to, to basically form a crystalline structure. And this is where we'll see on the bottom here a more beige-like color. And this is, this is vitally important because this means that we'll have a higher strength and higher quality material. And um, in order to do this, we need to keep the temperature above the glass transition temperature after we extrude which is about 150 degrees, and keep it at elevated temperatures for an extended period of time to allow this crystallization. So this is an, an, an extremely important um, feature that needs to be integrated into the process of 3D printing with this material, because if we don't have a heated chamber above 150 degrees, we won't achieve this nice beige color and crystalline structure, which results in uh, significantly weaker parts. So all of this to say, both of these problems are, are related to having better thermal management and having the presence of an elevated uh, heated build chamber, which is what we're focusing on in our research and development. When it comes to quality, I think these pictures speak for themselves. These are uh, close-ups of FTM prints, and this is typically the kind of quality that we would expect from uh, FFF 3D printing. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of filament-based printers on the market today, and um, they're fairly dumb printers, so to speak, because they're not closed-loop feedback printers. We adjust a bunch of parameters, generate a G-code, send it to the printer, and we kind of hope for the best. And the results are usually quite inconsistent, uh, apart from failed prints because of a jammed extruder or print coming off from the bed and creating a spaghetti monster, uh, as many of us may have seen. Uh, we also are experiencing very inconsistent results in terms of the print quality and the surface finish uh, due to over-extrusion, under-extrusion, or voids and gaps being produced in the print. Uh, so this is another major challenge with uh, FFF 3D printing, um, because again, we're trying to rival injection molding so that we can close this gap, and until we do that, we can't really expect FFF 3D printing, even if it's used with advanced materials like Peak or Ultim, to really be industrial. So at Innovo, we really like finding innovative solutions to really difficult problems. And we see these challenges as opportunities to improve the state of the art of industrial additive manufacturing. Uh, having, having had very much experience and understanding these problems and these issues and learning how to solve them, we've been able to develop a 3D printer that's capable of printing with Peak. And we're continuing our research and development in order to further optimize um, uh, this printer to solve these issues. In the process of doing that, um, we realized that Peak is also very, very difficult to print with. but we realized that we also created a printer that's capable of printing with other high-performance polymers, such as other polymers within the Peak family. Um, they're called PEEC, which is polyaryl ether ketone, or PEC. Uh, we're also capable of printing with Ultim, otherwise known as PEI, and PPSF, which is polyphenol sulfone. 
And this is really interesting because it opens up a wide range of opportunities to enter other industrial applications in automotive and aerospace uh, and electronics, as Chris has covered before. But nonetheless, we still believe that one of the most promising opportunities is in the medical industry with patient-specific implants. So these are a couple of prints that we produce off of our printer. And you'll notice the light beige color that we produce off of these prints. And this is exactly the kind of uh, characteristic that we want to see in a nice quality peak print. And this is important um, because we, we see this as a huge opportunity in an emerging industry. Uh, never before have we been able to produce such high quality accurate um, implants before, uh, patient specific implants for that matter. So uh, a cranium implant, like the one that we see here on the left, is traditionally produced using a method called cranioplasty, which is uh, a very artisanal, handcrafted way of producing an implant with uh, acrylic plaster, uh, to say the least. So it's, it's very complicated process that takes a lot of time, and this leads to a lot of risk during surgery because it's performed in surgery. However, by using modern technologies, we're able to use CT scans or DICOM scans to create a 3D image of a patient's trauma area, create a really accurate 3D model of the implant, and by 3D printing it, we're able to, uh, well, the, the goal is to be able to implant these materials onto patients uh, in a clinical trial and, and beyond that, um, going into full-scale production of, of these kinds of implants. But the, the, the advantages of doing this is that we're able to create a much more accurate implant which means that there's less adjustments that need to be done during the process of surgery, which means that there is better surgical planning, and we reduce the surgery time, which reduces the risk for the patient. So it's better for the doctor, and it's even safer for the patient. And we're able to bring these processes closer to patients and make them personalized for every patient. On the right, we'll see a spinal fusion cage. This is usually placed between vertebrae for people that herniated discs or have um, um, sp spinal issues, and this is typically an off-the-shelf product, so it's either one size fits all or it might come in small, medium, large, but the idea is that if we can make patient-specific implants, we don't have to choose one size fits all. We can have a, an implant that's personalized exactly to our needs. Okay. So um, we're continuing our R&D. We plan on releasing a product next year. And we're currently looking for R&D collaborations, um, people that are working with Peak and also interested in solving these very same problems with quality and isotropic strength as we are. Um, we're opening our doors to work with um, any R&D collaborators, uh, as well as uh, industry partners, um, whether you're a material manufacturer working with Peak or you're uh, a software provider, if you're interested in working with us, we're, we're uh, opening our doors. And we're also looking for investors to help us achieve this goal of being able to push the state of the art of 3D printing to the next level. So um, thank you very much. Uh, once again, my name is Adam, and this is Chris. And uh, if you have any questions, please, by all means. Also, uh, we're going to stick around for more questions afterwards, and we have a few of these prints here today, so you can actually check out some of our prints and handle them and, and see in more detail in the physical sense what we're up to. Okay, are there any questions here in the audience? Yes, there's one here. All right, so I've actually got uh, two questions uh, on your machine. So first of all, in your slides, you alluded to FFF and FDM being a, a subpar process and not really producing usable prints. Um, what is the process that, that you're using to produce peak prints? So we're using the same process uh, that, that we're seeing in FFF, but we're optimizing this process with an elevated heated chamber and better thermal management. Uh, so we're still in the current process of developing these technologies, but we believe with better thermal management and with better um, quality, quality monitoring, we'll be able to achieve much better results. Okay, so it is FDM in, in essence. Yes, yes, it is. Okay. Yes. And the second question would be, um, how do you handle crystallization? Because it, it wasn't really clear whether crystallization happens during the print, actually, or whether it's a post-processing um, process. And if it is a post-processing 
step, uh, how do you handle warping during that step? Right. That's a really good question. I, I didn't want to dive too much into technical details because there's, there's um, a lot of information surrounding the crystallinity of, of these kinds of semi-crystalline materials, but it, this is handled during the printing process. So as we heat it up, um, we need to cool down again, and that's when the crystallization process happens. So if we cool down too quickly, it'll become amorphous. Uh, so we need to handle this process in situ while we're, while we're actually physically printing. And this is done through better thermal management um, with the heated chamber as well as the heated bed. So there's many factors involved in terms of managing the temperature of the, uh, of the extrusion. Uh, the temperature of the print itself, which is usually through the heated chamber, and the temperature of the bed to ensure that the print does not also come loose or warp from the bed. Okay. Any more questions from the audience? Okay, from my side, what's your roadmap now? So uh, it looks fantastic, so where are you heading to? Yeah, for sure. Um, so the question was, what's our roadmap? We're really excited about where we are, where are we going? Um, over in the near future, so within the next 12 to 16 months, we basically plan to get to a stage of R&D where we actually have a printer with this thermal management that's meeting these anisotropic strengths, so strength in the Z direction, um, that's satisfactory for us and for our partners. Um, and then at that point, we would basically start to market that printer. Um, in the more short term, we're going to be working on R&D for that optimization for sure. Uh, and we're also looking at various funding sources such as potential research collaborations, potential investment, um, and of course grants. Yeah. You're located where? We're working in Berlin. Oh, that's good. We yeah. also do that. Oh, great. So, yeah. so I'm pretty happy for your uh, very interesting picky stuff. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing your machine very soon. And so thank you. And for the rest of the audience, it's uh, lunchtime now. Thanks very much. And uh, as I mentioned before, we'll be around afterwards. If you want to chat or have any more questions, we'd love to talk to you. Thanks so much, everybody.